Cześć. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank Olga and Paulina for inviting me to come and speak in Warsaw and also for getting me up on the stage today because last night I was feeling very ill and I thought I might not be able to come and talk to you here. But uh, they filled me full of drugs and gave me tea. So here I am, thanks to the wonders of medical science. So let's talk about creativity. It's a design conference, after all. Creativity is what we're here to celebrate. Creativity is an amazing thing that makes the world a better place. But it's a word I hear a lot now, in a lot of different contexts. If you tap it into Google, you get 362 million results. And most of them are things like this. Improve your creativity, increase your creativity, seven ways to boost your creativity. The bookshops are just absolutely full of books about creativity. It seems to be something that everybody wants without really understanding what it is. And in many ways, I think it's viewed as a, a kind of magical superpower. We look at it with awe and wonder. Tom Wolfe, the uh, brilliant American writer who sadly died this year, puts it this way. The modern notion of art is an essentially religious or magical one in which the artist is viewed as a holy beast who in some way, big or small, receives flashes from the Godhead, which is known as creativity. So if you're asked to think about who is a creative person, you probably think of somebody like this, Pablo Picasso, or if you're interested in a different medium, David Bowie, we tend to think of creative people as somehow special. These people who have a direct connection with the gods. And this view is deeply embedded in our culture. Even if you look at the word inspiration, if you look at the etymology of it, where it comes from, it actually means the immediate influence of a god. It comes from the same root as respiration. It's about breathing. So if you're inspired, apparently, you've been breathed on by the gods. And this idea goes way, way back to ancient Greece. And in ancient Greece, creative artists were thought to be inspired by the Muses, who were nine goddesses, the daughters of Zeus. And that was how you got your creative energy, by connecting with the gods. And the Muses were most commonly found in the company of two of their brothers. Apollo and Dionysus. Apollo is the god of reason, order, logic, and strangely music, although it's not that strange because for the ancient Greeks, music was very closely connected with mathematics. Dionysus, on the other hand, is associated with irrationality, emotion, intuition, and wine, which probably makes you all three of those things. And in the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche, the uh, German philosopher, wrote a book about the history and development of Greek tragedy. And in it, he said, we shall have gained much for the science of aesthetics when we've come to realize that the continuous evolution of art is bound up with the duality of the Apollonian and the Dionysian. So basically, he's saying that to make good art, we need to have both these things. We need to have reason, order, and logic, and we also need to have irrationality, emotion, and instinct. Now, Nietzsche's thesis was that the Greeks made great art when they had both, but as their civilization developed, they became too Apollonian, they became too logical, and that's when their art suffered. But my thesis is that nowadays we put too much emphasis on Dionysus. We put too much emphasis on emotion and inspiration. So of course, we all want to be creative. It's what we do for a living. But today, I'd like to talk a bit more about being apparently uncreative. 
And this particularly interests me, I think, because of the path that my own career took. So as a child, I used to love to paint and draw, like we all did. I think Picasso said, every child is an artist. The difficult thing is to remain an artist as you grow old. But of course, the other reason that we can be creative when we're children is that we don't have any clients. But from being passionate about art and drawing when I was young, I ended up going to a very academic school, and I went to study modern languages at Trinity College, Oxford. Now, going to Oxford might seem like a strange way to prepare for a career as a graphic designer, and I certainly thought it was at the time. But the education that I had there was actually surprisingly useful. So when I was studying at Oxford, we had this thing called the tutorial system. And really, for the three years of my course, up till my final exams, the only thing I had to do was turn up once a week to my tutor's room, which was this doorway here in Trinity College, sit down on his sofa and read him an essay, and then he would talk to me about the essay. That was it. That's what a tutorial is. But of course, in order to deliver the essay and have the conversation, I had to go through a process. So the process started with research, obviously. I would be set a subject. I would research the subject. I would generate my ideas. I would craft those ideas together into a coherent essay. Then I would have to present that essay to my tutor by reading it out. And then he would critique it. So research, ideas, craft, presentation, and critique. Now, when I left Oxford, and almost by accident, I became a designer. As a junior designer, I used to feel very inadequate because everybody else around me had been to design school. And I thought that somehow I'd had the wrong kind of education, and I should have gone to design school too. But after a few years, I began to realize that actually the process that I used to go through to write essays about Spanish literature at Oxford is exactly the process that I go through on every design project. Starting with probably the most important thing, research. Now, when I was doing my research at Oxford, it was long before the internet. So research basically meant working in libraries. This is the Institutio Tayloriana in Oxford, the modern language library, where I used to do most of my work. So most days, you would find me there. Sometimes, if I was researching a particular subject, I would go and work in other libraries. Sometimes I would go to the PhD library, Duke Humphreys Library, which you may recognize from a certain set of movies. And this gave me a real love of libraries and a love of archives. And you know, there's nothing really I enjoy more than digging around in an archive. And this plays a role in almost every design project that I do. So for example, two years ago, we redesigned this newspaper, the Berlingske Tidende in Copenhagen, Denmark, one of the oldest newspapers in Europe. First issue was published in 1749. And this heraldic crest was a very important part of their identity. So as part of the redesign process, we did a set of historical research going through the history of this heraldic crest from 1749, then it changed in 1743. This is what they used in 1936. They redrew it again in 1968 and 1995. And this was the version that they had when we came in to do the project. And as a result of our investigations, we decided that actually the one we liked best was the one from 1936. And we had that redrawn by La Tigre in Milan. And it became a really important part of the branding for Berlingske. Of course, not everybody has a kind of a heraldic history. But a lot of the clients that we work with do have a, a brand history and a design history. So for example, when we redesigned L'Express, which is a weekly news magazine based in Paris. 
Once again, the first thing that we did was to go into their archives and dig through all the old issues and see what we could find. And when you go through this process, you find a lot of different stuff, some of it relevant and useful, some of it not so relevant and useful, but you're trying to capture the sort of historical spirit of a publication. Maybe they want to change completely, and in that case, going through their history might not bring you to anywhere relevant. But I usually find, more often than not, that if you look at the history of a magazine or a newspaper, you find something useful which you can plug into the design project that you're working on. But of course, just gathering a load of research like this doesn't get you anywhere. You become snow blind. So it's not just about the research, it's about the filtering too. And sometimes we can spend days in an archive gathering thousands of images, and in the end, you just get it down to something like this. There may be four or five things that you think are interesting. But actually, in this case, the things that we found from the design from the early 60s had a very strong influence on where we ended up. And this is a project that we did in the Netherlands. It was a redesign of the, the biggest independent TV news network there, RTL News. And when we embarked upon this, again, we did the usual kind of history. We did the, the history of their design to start with. It was not particularly relevant or interesting. But the other thing that we tend to do is research the competitors. So we started looking at them in the context of their competitors. That's what RTL was using. This is NOS, which is the Dutch state broadcaster. That's BBC, which you can get very easily in the Netherlands. And that's Al Jazeera, which again is available to most of RTL's audience. And when we looked at all this stuff, we began to see a theme emerging, which led us on a research path into a really interesting little bit of cultural history. So everybody uses these globes, these kind of pulsating globes, and we were trying to work out where they came from. And the farthest we got back was the 1930s. Here is an illustrated summary of the news. It will be followed by the latest film of events and happenings at home and abroad. So this is Pathé Newsreels from the 1930s, where they used to be shown in cinemas. And that's the first instant of the rotating globe in association with news. And it's really there to say, I think, that these people have coverage. They can bring you images from places that you have no access to, which in the 1930s was very true. And then in the 1950s, another piece of iconography came along. So this is all about the technology, the, the powerful technology of the broadcasters. So you put the globe together with the pulsating technological radio waves, and you end up with almost every piece of television news branding in the world. But of course, this iconography is based on a, a completely different age when broadcasters did have unique access to images, and the audience couldn't find them anywhere else. But nowadays, you know, we've had 24-hour cable news for nearly 40 years. We have Twitter, we have Instagram, we have YouTube. It's no longer like this, where everybody sits in a room and looks at the TV. And yet, all the TV stations are still using this imagery. So that really interesting piece of research led us to one very strong conclusion about the project, which was that we weren't going to do any spinning, pulsating globes. So to me, I think research is the most essential part of any design project. This is my friend Sean Perkins from North Design in the UK. They do fantastic work in the cultural sector for corporations and for hospitality. And Sean says, all our work at North is driven by a very rigorous process of research and hunting. And in most cases, this stage creates the most exciting material for the future. It's this process and rigorous analysis which creates our solution. So after research comes the ideas. 
But often, as Sean suggested there, if you do the right research, the ideas kind of happen without you having to try too hard. So on the L'Express project, we did our historical research into the development of the logo. We became particularly interested in this version, which had been done by Walter Bernard and Milton Glaser from New York when they redesigned L'Express in the 1970s. And we became even more interested by that little wedge-shaped apostrophe. And we brought that into the new design, and that led us to this concept of the speech bubble on the front of the magazine. So actually, we didn't need any flashes of inspiration from the gods for that. It just came out of the research. Or if you look at this project, which Sean's studio did for the St. Pancras Renaissance Hotel in London, it was a a renovation of a beautiful historical Victorian building, including a hotel at St. Pancras Station. And they, their research led them to a solution through actually being on the ground and looking at the environment. So St. Pancras used to be famous for this clock, which eventually was taken away and put in somebody's barn in the countryside. But when they redeveloped St. Pancras for the Eurostar terminal, they rebuilt the clock. And the most distinctive thing about the clock is these diamonds. All the numbers are placed in diamonds, and the diamond was the solution. That became the whole basis of the brand, even to the A's. You can see the diamond shape in the A's in St. Pancras. But I don't know if you're familiar with Chuck Close, the uh, American painter and photographer. He, there's a lot of great quotes from Chuck Close. His work is these kind of monumental paintings. He says, inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. If you wait around for the clouds to part and a bolt of lightning to strike you in the brain, you're not going to make an awful lot of work. All the best ideas come out of the process. So when you've got your ideas, you have to craft them. And even Stefan Sagmeister, who you might think of one of the more kind of intuitive designers around, says, I'm not very spontaneous, but very focused. Great work is formally good work that has been pushed very hard, and I firmly believe this. You get something to a certain level, but the craft is what takes it to another level. And of course, there are many, many kinds of design craft, but I'd like to talk a bit about one which is not the most obvious, and that is mathematics. So in our studio, this is our most useful tool, the calculator. Design and mathematics have a long history together, way back to the, the classical orders of architecture, which are based on very rigorous mathematical proportions. And of course, if you were here yesterday watching Adi Binder talking about the golden section and the Fibonacci sequence and his FIBO design system, you can see that mathematics can be a very useful tool for designers. Although it's a strange thing about the golden section, once you notice it, you start to see it everywhere. And there are things like this all over the internet about how all these logos are based on the golden section. And it turns out, when you really dig down, that most of them weren't. The designers weren't aware that they were using the golden section, but they made an aesthetic judgment, which happens to reflect it. But logo construction is one place where you do still tend to see a lot of mathematics in design. This is a classic piece of branding from the 1960s in England, David Gentleman's British Steel word mark. And this had to be mathematically constructed, because in those days, you couldn't make digital signs with a computer. So these signs had to be made by a sign writer using a compass and a ruler. So of course, they had to follow some pretty basic mathematical principles. But even nowadays, when logos are nearly always supplied as digital vectors, we still go through the motions of trying to give them a mathematical justification. I think in most cases, these judgments are actually just made for aesthetics, and the mathematics is a bit of a post-rationalization. But there's one form of mathematics that's very, very important to the work that we do in my studio, and that is grids. So we do magazine design, newspaper design, we do a lot of digital work for magazines and newspapers, and we also do TV, and all of those are based on mathematical grids. So we tend to start with a basic piece of text typography, and of course that has a baseline, as we all know, 
which gives you a baseline grid. But in editorial, we often also like to look at the, the cap height or the ascenders of the typeface. And that gives you another measure. So if you put the cap height and the baseline together, you get a cap height grid and a baseline grid. And this has the advantage that you can make the top of the images always line up with the top of the text. And the bottom of the images line up with the text. So that gives you a grid like this. And this becomes a design system that often determines a lot of the uh, typographic decisions as well. So for example, when we're making a newspaper, we'll build our grid. And the headline sizes that we choose are not because they look right. They always have a mathematical relationship to the grid. So you see each line of this headline occupies four lines of the grid. The next headline down occupies three lines of the grid. So a bit like what Addy was showing you yesterday, it becomes a design system, which means that you can make mathematical decisions that have an aesthetic quality. And we also tend to make magazine and newspaper grids that are modular, that have horizontal divisions as well as columns. And this becomes a really torturous process sometimes of calculator work. This is the grid for a magazine called Domus in Italy, an architecture magazine that we designed last year. And we went through so many different versions of this. We tried six modules of 10 lines, 11 modules of five lines, 19 modules of three lines, five modules of 10 lines, and one module of eight lines. Don't know why we did that. 10 modules of six lines, before we ended up with 18 modules of four lines. And once again, the typographic system is based on a mathematical relationship to the grid. So our basic text type setting had a line feed, a leading of 12.3 point, and then all the other type sizes were based on multiples of that, which gave us this very rich typographic system. The so grids are like a fascinating world that you can dive into. My friend Francesco Franchi, the brilliant art director from Italy, who's now at La Repubblica, did this wonderful magazine called Eel between 2008 and 2016. And he revived this grid from Swiss designer Carl Gerstner, which was originally created in 1962. And as you can see, it's pretty bonkers, but it is all based on a series of mathematical principles, which mean that you can use it for two columns, three columns, four columns, five columns, or six columns. And you can do that vertically, too. Even the design of the logo is based on mathematics. And we even do this on our motion projects and television projects, too. So this is the RTL grid. And in exactly the same way that we would do on a magazine, all our typographics are based on mathematical relationships to the grid. So mathematics may not seem like the most creative part of graphic design, but it's a very important part of the craft. And as the great designers Charles and Reims said, the details are not the details. They make the product. So research, ideas, and craft get us to a stage where we have something to show the client. The next stage is maybe the most difficult of all, and that's the presentation. So when I was at Oxford reading out my essay, that was all I had to do, sit and read an essay. But the dynamics and the psychology of a design presentation are extremely complex. But the presentation is also very, very important. As Paula Scher from Pentagram in New York says, the design is never really the hard part of the job. The hard part is persuading people to use it. Now, this quote comes from a Netflix show called Abstract. I don't know if you have that in Netflix Poland. Uh, if you do have it and you've never watched it, it's a fantastic series of shows about different types of design, and there's one dedicated to Paula Scher in which she explains the dynamics of a design project. But, you know, the psychology of a design presentation is very strange. The designer turns up with some work in which they've invested a lot of energy that they want approval for. The client is probably nervous because the point of a new design is about change, and change makes people anxious. They prefer the familiar. So it's not simply about a, a kind of objective assessment of the design. 
There's much more at stake than that. So on that Netflix show, Paula Scher described the arc of a design presentation in this very interesting way. So you start the meeting, and this horizontal line represents a reasonable level of expectation. You know, that's kind of what people are expecting to see. So you show them your first designs, and hopefully everyone gets excited about it. Yay, this looks really great. You ride that for a moment, but then people start asking questions or criticizing it. Then the energy level drops right back down to the baseline. And this is where the designer has to start talking fast and being clever and coming up with some good justification for the work that they've done. If you manage that, you could get it back up never as high as it was at the very beginning, but you can get it sort of reasonably close. And this is the point at which the presentation must end, according to Paula Scher. Because if you don't do that, somebody's going to come back with another set of questions and rebuttals. The level is going to drop below the level that you started at. If you're really smart, you might get it back up a bit again, but it's probably just going to disappear, and that's the death of the project. So we have a couple of techniques that we use to try and control this process. By its nature, it's completely uncontrollable. But I use one trick that I learned from doing my final exams in Oxford. This is the examination schools where you take your exams. I had to do 11 three-hour exams in seven days. It was pretty intense. I developed this system of restating the question always at the beginning of the answer. So they'd ask you a question. I would, my first sentence would always be restating the question and explaining how I was going to answer it. And this still forms the basis of the design and presentations that we do today. Presentations, people are very secretive about presentations. You know, I've been in this business 30 years, and I've seen very few other designers presenting. Uh, I really don't know what other people do. But I'm just going to show you a few slides from one of our presentations, which was the presentation for this magazine, L'Express, to show how we try to use that technique of restating the question leading to the answer. So this is a real slide that we showed L'Express before we showed them any design work. The first thing that we did was we read back to them some of the things that they'd said to us in the initial workshops. The next thing we did was we restated the principles that they gave us at the very beginning of the project. We showed the priorities that we'd collected from all our discussion and research with them about what the qualities, what the essential nature of L'Express was. And we stated the design principles that we would apply in our design. So by showing them all this stuff, of course, it's not a foolproof system, but you start to make the design that you're about to show seem like an inevitable solution to the question. Uh, and this is the, the approach that we take on every project. And there's another way that we try to forestall that instant reaction in a presentation that will knock the energy level down and take it below the baseline. Uh, and that's by trying to make the client understand that we are not really interested in first impressions because of the kind of work that we do. So when we design a magazine, you know, we don't want someone to buy one copy of that magazine. We don't want somebody to buy one copy of a newspaper. We don't want them to log onto a website once. We want them to keep coming back. So we're interested in building long-term relationships between users and products. Now, other people's work is different. If you're designing a poster or maybe a point-of-sale package, of course, the first impression is very valuable. But for us, the first impression is not the point because, as Daniel Kahneman said, he's a, a Nobel Prize-winning cognitive science, scientist who wrote a great book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And he says, familiarity breeds liking. Basically, the more we see things, the more we get to like them. And that's why the design presentation is such an artificial environment, because people are seeing something for the first time, which is quite threatening. But I always try to say to clients, of course, give me your instant reactions, but I'm much more interested in what you think three days from now, or a week from now, or a month from now. 
So we always ask them to keep it on their desk, or stick it on their wall, or keep it on their screen, keep coming back to it, and give us their response a week later, not on the day of the presentation. The final stage of that process that I laid out earlier was the critique. Now, in my Oxford days, that was when my tutor would respond to my essay, often tearing it apart completely. These are some of the smartest people in the world and real experts in their field. So if you're going to argue back and defend what you've written, you've got to be pretty on the ball. But that thing that we were looking at about how presentations go, that first rebuttal, that first critique, why did you do this, questioning the design decisions, is a really difficult moment. But clients will always do this. You know, a designer-client relationship is not a doctor-patient relationship. The client doesn't think that you're some wonderful expert who's going to always make their life better. You're not just there to talk about design, you're there to talk about the client's business, too. And the client may know less than you do about design, but they certainly know a lot more about their business than you do. So I like to think that the best client is a client who's smarter than you, because you can learn from them. So let me introduce you to uh, Giovanni Di Mauro, who's a great client of ours. We've had a relationship with Giovanni for 10 years now. He's the editor of a magazine in Rome called Internazionale. And 10 years ago, he asked us to do a redesign. And this is the project that we delivered. Because he was in Rome and the budget wasn't great, most of this conversation was happening by email. So in Giovanni's first email, he gave us a briefing. Our design is not beautiful, but it works. We're not looking for a radical redesign. Polish, refresh, update, you know, reasonable brief. So we went away, did some work, and we showed him this. And we got the email back saying, thank you for the redesign pages. They are good. Yay. But not the direction I want Internationale to go. Oh, OK. They're too magazine style while I'm looking for a newspaper style. Well, that's a useful bit of feedback. It's not a kind of mindless criticism. So we went away and worked on version two. So a couple of weeks later, we sent him this. And he came back saying, I like it. This is what I was looking for. Sober, clean, professional, but not boring or gloomy. Great, we thought, cracked it. And then we read on, as for the fonts, what do you think of Publico and Stag? I like them, and I think they could work well in Internazionale. Now, as a designer, your immediate reaction there is, well, I chose the fonts I chose because I thought they were the best fonts for the job. And I particularly didn't want to try Publico because I was involved in the creation of Publico. We commissioned it for a newspaper in Portugal. But Giovanni seemed like an intelligent and likable client. So rather than just pushing back, we thought, OK, let's try it, see how it changes the design. So we did this, and it looked pretty good. I liked it kind of as much as I liked the first one. And Giovanni said, I like it very much. It's fresher and more surprising. It's the newspaper touch I was looking for. So at this moment, the project seemed to be over with a very positive ending. And then an email came in from Giovanni saying, Internationale should be more like a newspaper and less like a magazine. The Economist and the New Yorker are more like a newspaper than a magazine. So we dug out our copies of the New Yorker and the Economist and tried to work out what he liked about them and went on to version three. And then we got the email that we've been waiting for. Yes. So time to get the champagne out. And this is the design that they ended up with. But the, in the intervening 10 years, on the basis of that design, we've done digital design for them, we've done motion design, we've done special magazines, we've done, you know, we've done a lot for Internationale over the intervening years. And the reason that we built that relationship with them was because of that dialogue with the client and by us not just freaking out and telling them to get lost when they criticized our work, but by being open-minded. And in the end, we got a better magazine out of it, 
and we also got a very long-term relationship. But there's another set of critiques that you have to deal with. After you've dealt with the client's critiques and the project is in the real world, you have to deal with critiques from the audience too. I used to work for this guy, Tibor Kalman, who was an amazing designer, sadly died of cancer too young. And Tibor used to say, why do designers think they have better ideas about what things should look like than ordinary human beings? Now, Tibor loved to provoke people, particularly designers, uh, and I know that he believed in the power of design, and he believed in design experts as the people to find solutions. But I think that what he's saying here is that, as designers, we should design with humility, and we should remember who we're designing for. We're not designing for ourselves, we're not designing for other designers, we're designing for our audience. So we have to listen to what they say and treat them with respect. Now, sometimes the audience feedback is positive. This redesign of The Guardian, which I and my team did in 2005, is the only project I've ever worked on where the reactions were universally favorable. People said things like, no compromise, perfect intellectual and aesthetic symmetry. I've fallen in love. But almost 20 years earlier, when David Hillman of Pentagram redesigned The Guardian, and it was his design that we replaced, he got a very different set of reactions. I think you've had one meeting too many. Got the comic, where's the newspaper? How does it feel to be responsible for the death of a newspaper? Now, of course, The Guardian didn't die. It's still there. I redesigned it in 2005. It was redesigned again earlier this year. David wasn't responsible for the death of a newspaper. But audiences tend to react in this very hostile way. And this was in the days before email, when people actually had to sit down at a typewriter and write these letters to the editor. But you have to understand why people have these reactions. And we often say, redesigning a magazine or a newspaper or a website that people go to every day is a bit like going into somebody's house in the middle of the night and rearranging their furniture. It's something that they're very comfortable with, it's very familiar to them, and then one day they wake up and everything has changed. It's not surprising that they're going to freak out about it. But as Daniel Kahneman said, familiarity breeds liking. And if you keep your nerve, usually you'll find that after a week, people no longer react like this. And after a month, they've forgotten what it looked like before. So we should respect our audience, we should listen to our audience, but we shouldn't listen too closely to their instant reactions. And of course, in the digital world, we get a completely different type of feedback from the audience. It's not just the comments that people write and send us. Most of our clients are using Google Analytics, Chartbeat, these things that tell us exactly how the audience is behaving. And this is a kind of audience feedback that you absolutely cannot disagree with. You may design something that you think is fantastic. And when we were designing newspapers and magazines, we knew how many copies we were selling, but we never really knew how people were reading them. But now, in the digital world, we know exactly which pages people are on, how long they're spending there, which parts of the page they're looking at. And this you know, can be quite shocking if you've come from the old world of design, but it's a very important way of getting feedback from our audience. And as designers, we have to respect that. So in that way, I think the, the digital world has brought us a really positive new set of feedback, but it's also brought us a much more negative set of feedback. So when you put a design project out there, particularly one that's quite high profile, this is the kind of thing that usually happens. First of all, it gets flamed on Twitter. People make little jokes about it. And it can be very demoralizing, I think. And then there are sites like Brand New. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Brand New and look at Brand New. It's a kind of site that uh, critiques branding projects. And even the articles that the people on the site write can be very harsh. But when you look at the comments, this logo is tragic. Dear God, so shallow. Goodbye, another logo that looked unique. Hello, another bland crap. This logo is straight up terrible. I mean, it's incredible that people can write these things. You put a project into the world 
with good faith, you've put your heart and soul into it as a professional designer, and this is the kind of thing you get back. Now, of course, most of these people are just trolls, and we shouldn't take any notice of them. So we have to work out what feedback to listen to when we're critiqued, and what feedback not to listen to. Chapel Ellison is a great design writer and educator from the US, and she discusses these issues a lot on her website. She says there are some things you can do when facing criticism. One of these things is to stop and ask yourself, is this helpful or not helpful? Well, that's a very basic thing, but if we can make that distinction, most of the comments that you see on Brand New are not helpful at all, but some of them might be helpful. The, clients, the, the comments that we get from intelligent, thoughtful clients are useful. So that's how we make our distinction. We listen to the positive, constructive criticism because it helps us make our work better, but we don't listen to the negative, trolling criticism. So, research, ideas, craft, presentation, and critique. Now, those are things which I learned how to do as an undergraduate at Oxford University, and I'm still doing them every day as a professional designer. Which of these are creative and which are uncreative? I don't really know, and I don't really think it matters very much. So I'll leave you with a quote from Massimo Vignelli, who is one of the, the greatest graphic designers of the 20th century and multidisciplinary designers of the 20th century. And Massimo says, good design is a matter of discipline. It starts by looking at the problem and collecting all the available information about it. If you understand the problem, you have the solution. It's really more about logic than imagination. So winding back to the beginning, of course we all want to be about like Dionysus. We all want to have a glass of wine and have brilliant insights and inspiration from the gods. But in order to do our jobs, we also have to be a lot like Apollo. Thank you.